Don't judge it. Enjoy it. Don't smudge it. Forgive it. That grievance. You could drop it. It only hurts you. So you can stop it. I had uh, two questions that were coming up. One is uh, around the state of the body in the throat. That's been. Uh, it's just been having this experience over the past few weeks, and then coming here to use it and to sing, it's, it's, it's been this source of annoyance and frustration, and having the desire to, you know, to heal and whatever, and, and being open to, you know, to listening to things that you just shared about with uh, Radiance about and all that. So that was, that was one thing. Yeah. I have something to say. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can hear it coming. I heard the breath coming. <laughs> yeah, because I had a powerful experience with that last uh, November. Um, I was in Belgium and Eric's mother died and I came back to California to assist to the funeral. And after two days there, I, I lost my voice and his father had asked us to sing together for the funeral. And I was like, okay, I don't know how it's going to happen. But magically, actually, the spirit just poured through. And, and I feel that's really what it is. When it's given, it's just come through. And you don't even have to think about it. And you realize that there is no sickness. It's just a state of mind. It's just that needs to be washed through and by by just allowing the spirit to use the form the way it wants and showing up wherever you are meant to be trusting fully that that you will be used the way you are meant to be you will that will disappear that will not even be a problem and what is sickness is um, just the denial of truth in thinking, thinking that I can be something that I am not. It's really being identified with the body and denying my true nature. That's what sickness is all about. Mm -hmm. And so healing is not necessarily healing of the body. It's just recognizing my true nature and aligning, aligning with spirit and let the form be used the way it's meant to be. And whether the symptom disappear or not is not even important. And most of the time it will. And sometimes it's just for a short while, just allowing you to sing the song you need to sing, and then it's back again. But yeah, it's just really trusting that I feel a really a deep trust in the spirit for the use of the form. And to not being identified in any way with this form, because that is so limiting. Mm. Yeah, it's like, it's truly, if, if the ego is unworthiness, and and the ego is the only thing that needs to be exposed and released, then you can see that it's such a gift and the music pours through you and, and Greg it's you know, that's part of part of the gifts that just shine and radiate through you. And yet when the mind becomes identified even with the gifts, uh, and your song was talking about really the gift is the present, uh, and the present moment is so far beyond the body that it's really the way that the Holy Spirit works where, you know, you, you come to a music festival and, you know, you say, I, yeah, I, I'm an artist, I have my gifts to share and extend, and when this stuff starts to go on with the throat, then it's really a huge call for healing. That's the, the reason for which you came, really wasn't to sing, but, but was to, to expose any scrap of unworthiness or any idea that, the, that your worth and your worthiness is associated with singing. And, and what a beautiful, beautiful opportunity. You might say it's a perfect setup to heal mm -hmm. in the most highest way possible. Uh, we were talking, Eric last year uh, came and, and came up on the stage and everyone was sitting there waiting and, and he really went into a uh, great meditation. Uh, <laughs> And, and I heard so many different artists um, after Eric's non-performance uh, that, that came up and were talking to Eric and to myself going, you don't know how healing that was, man, to watch you up there 
and just being there and and you know it was great you know we were all kind of cheering him on because it was like facing that line of of except expectations expectations of singing expectations of performance and so on and so forth you know that was so beautiful and so healing when I heard people coming up afterwards, they were saying, what allowance you gave me, what permission you gave me. It was just reflecting this idea that, that you just trust what the form is going to be. It'll just come as it comes without any subtle expectations. I need to sing, I need to sing well. Um, you know, that's another layer that can come in. Um, and underneath it is, is to be worthy. I need to sing. Um, and, and think how it works with reciprocity too. Sometimes if there's a sense of having a job to do or getting paid for something and feeling like I'm, I'm not doing the job or I'm not performing up to standards and this and that, there's a lot of pressure and guilt of trying to live up to a standard. And it's the ego that made up these concepts, you know, to keep the mind guilty, to try to live up to these standards. I think for you it's great because it's, it's much more subtle, but yet we can still see that you really deep down you just want to know yourself as you truly are, know God, and have peace of mind, experience peace of mind. That's really your deepest desire. Beyond the singing, beyond anything else, you're just offering it up to the Holy Spirit. And as Armel was saying, that, that what an opportunity to really get in touch with whatever is little tether is still there. Mm. Yeah, it's like that's really the undoing of the self-concept of being a musician and this whole festival is about that. Whoever here has any self-concept of I am a musician and it's who I am will just probably hit the wall at some point because the purpose is so strong and it's really about all about that and so it's beautiful really. <laughs> And so for sure, whatever's underneath it will come up. And it might appear as a throat pain or anything like that, but it's for the best. Yeah. I can think of a funny example too. Years ago, I was trailing around giving all my Course in Miracle talks and, and a news report came in that uh, Frank Sinatra had collapsed on a stage, I think in Las Vegas. Boom! Just went straight down, face first on the stage. And I was like, Ooh. straight down and everything. And they, they said, he was, get, what song was he singing? My Way. My Way. <laughs> he was right in the middle of a rendition. I did it my way. Yes, there were times I'm sure you knew when I bit off more than I could chew. <laughs> Bang. And the whole song goes on. I mean, you know, it's like when you listen to the song. <laughs> when there was doubt, I ate it up and spit it out. You know, and through it all, through all the adversity and all the tragedy, all the attack, all the thing, I stood tall and I did it my way. Boom. <laughs> right down. I just couldn't help but laugh when I heard Frank Sinatra fell over on the stage singing my way. Because, you know, to me, I was like, okay, you know, that's undoing the self-concept, all right, you know, it's, it's the same for all of us, you know, nobody escapes <laughs> the, the undoing of the ego, that's what it's all about. <laughs> but, you know, when we're prayerful, when we're open, when we're more conscious and aware of it, it's even better because we, we really pay attention. You know, if ever I was giving a talk and I started to feel a tickle or something like that, I would just pray and go inward and say, okay, this is good, we got something going on here. Maybe I've got a slight expectation of speaking even that I need to let go of right here. And it was, it's good when we're more conscious of that because we can dive into that prayerful state. <laughs> okay, Greg's got another question. <laughs> Well, the last one is just, you know, just the, just the word sexuality. That was what's been just ruminating of, not getting into specifics, but just feeling the need to just... <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. Well, it's, <laughs> that's good. That's that's a good topic. Uh, well, you you could say that that the Holy Spirit uses everything that the ego made. So the ego made the bodies, and the ego made the world, and so on and so forth. And so, just like with everyone who's come here, whether we were talking to Laverne about overcoming uh, a sense of false empathy with yielding into true empathy, or uh, we were talking about the rage and the anger and, and opening up, letting it up and out, um, we'll say sexual desires are very, very much like all appetites, uh, whether it's hunger or thirst or sexual desire or desire for movement or if you could just fill in the blank, desire for stimulation in many different ways beyond just what seems to be the realm of sexuality. When Jesus first dictated the course to Helen Schuckman, um, he actually talked about um, misdirected uh, impulses in terms of the body and in terms of sexuality, and then he just changed it to a broader term, um, to misdirected physical impulses, because he wanted to cover the whole gamut of the human condition, not just sexuality. So when there's the belief in separation, when there's the belief in duality, and the miracle impulse, which is just coming up through awareness, when it goes through the filter of, of lack, it comes out as a craving. There's obviously no cravings in heaven, because everything's just pure, pure fulfillment, but sexual cravings, you could say, and sexual desires that come up are very much coming through the filter of the ego. And the more that you get into purpose, the more those impulses are not misdirected. You actually can experience them directly as without the filter. And what those impulses are, are a call to return to your awareness as one with God. It's just they get almost like a a beam of light coming through a prism and gets splintered out into all those different colors. When you get back past the prism, you get back to the actual beam, you see it's all about knowing yourself as God created you. But this is a process in time in which the Holy Spirit is, is in charge. So you might say, as you go deeper and deeper with the Spirit, your mind becomes deeper and deeper into a state of stillness, rest, contentment, and you don't attempt to use the body or the world in an inappropriate way, meaning in a way that is still trying to manipulate or control, you come back to just more the dreamer of the dream or the observer. So what seems to be, in human terms, a very big area, like a lot of other eating and other areas, as you go deeper and you clear away the judgments, your mind gets more still and all of those things become like a non-issue. You know, you're, you're like more the observer of the world and you're not a participant in the human kind of sense. So that's been my experience uh, around sexuality too. It's been trusting the Holy Spirit, letting it be used, letting it be used, letting it be used, but the relationship becomes one of connecting to purpose, and you, the more lined up with that you become, those kind of things that, that seem quite complicated and mysterious while you're going through them, just start to fade and fade and fade away from awareness, and, and it's just, it just disappears. So that's kind of just a synopsis to that one word. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So are you saying sexuality itself disappears, or just the way that one um, interacts with with form and with the world, like you're saying, with uh, with eating or any other impulses? It just it transforms into just a different state. Well, it, you could say that that every discipline, every theme, every topic of the world involves the parts. I mean, when when we talk about sexuality, we can talk about homosexuality, heterosexuality, um, you can go bisexuality and so forth. You, you can, if you read books, you know, different books, whether it's the Kama Sutra or, you know, research books and that are done, 
all of them have, have sexuality as a topic and they get into the various parts and the aspects of the sexuality. As you go deeper in the mind into forgiveness, you perceive a unified world. And so all those parts, whether you're talking about auto mechanics or sexuality or diet or ecology or whatever, they all become blended together and unified into a unified perception of the world. So in one sense, you, you move towards a state of stillness in which the mind no longer identifies with the parts, it no longer identifies with the past or future, and therefore what seemed to be a topic just absolutely collapses. And all the issues and questions and mysteries all collapse too into that state of mind. So, you know, in that sense, when you go through life, you know, it's your whole perception of the world changes and what seemed to be who you were in the past is no longer the case. So it's, it's just a very different perception of the world. You're very disidentified from the, the body, from the personality self. That's why our talks are all really about the call in all of its different ways, but it's very, very different from what the world would call sexuality. Yeah, and desires disappear too. So. But I, I also have um, this, th this thought coming to my mind about how the ego uses sexuality as a way to hold you back or push, push love away. Because there's so much guilt and shame associated with it that if there, there is any sexual desire in the joining with someone, then it will be like, oh, I'm doing something bad and kind of trying to, to really go away from it. But actually, um, it's there only when you hold back. When there is a holding back mechanism on the flow of love, then all, that's when all those misdirected miracle impulses are coming up. It's when there is a, a cut in the flow of the spirit, which is truly a holding back or trying to push it away or being scared of it, and really to come in this innocence. That it's all, it's, there's really nothing wrong in that. And just using it that way to really come back constantly to this innocence that it doesn't mean anything about me, neither about the other. It's, and it's all about the love. And so trusting the love and trusting the flow and trusting the joining and let go of the judgment that is about, oh, I shouldn't, I shouldn't have any sexual desire. I shouldn't feel that way. Positively or negatively, it could be attraction or repulsion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the ego will say, uh, don't, don't even go there, and it's very much about avoidance. But, but it's important to get underneath that avoidance, you know, into the miracle. And the same with attraction, you know, it, it can be something like there's an attraction, and then there's a desire to repeat mm -hmm. things. And Krishnamurti used to give these talks about how that's how time, linear time works, if you have an experience that you think of and you, you remember from the past that was pleasurable and you want to repeat that pleasurable experience, he described that as the movement of time. And you see it could relate to sexuality, it could relate to food, it could relate to climate or any kind of sensation. Mm -hmm. That that's why when you get into the miracle it takes you literally beyond the senses into a miraculous state of mind of complete fulfillment, just seeing the false as false. So it's good to, to start to see how, how that's even connected to time. But, but um, I love how the Holy Spirit uses everything to, to lift the mind, to pop the mind from the limitations into the miracle. I remember years ago I traveled with a woman who had been, went into the convent when she was 14 years old, right in adolescence, you know, right during puberty. And she was in the convent from 14 to 22. And then after she left, said no to Mother Superior, she was supposed to get married to Jesus, she left him at the altar. Uh, and then, um, I said, hmm, how did that go? She said, well, tell me about this Course in Miracles. And I said, he's back. 
<laughs> you don't leave Jesus behind. You know, you, you can't really get rid of him. Uh, he's, he's coming for your awakening, and I said, you may have ditched him uh, at age 22 uh, and didn't take your final vows, but, but now he's back in the Course, and he's saying, yeah, I'm still with you, and, and we're going to have this union of, of self as the Christ. And what happened was, she had so much repression and denial from all those years, you know, in the convent, going through all those steps, novitiate and all these different steps, that she had all this guilt and she projected it onto the body and she had all kinds of avoidance mechanisms going around sexuality. And we went on a trip in 1991 to Sedona and, and the Holy Spirit, Jesus, had her skinny dipping and going out naked to, to go the other way, like, let's bring this up. There's an avoidance pattern going on. I had another friend that I traveled with who, she had, was just so sexually active for so many years, you know, really heavily sexually active that, you know, that uh, when she opened up to Jesus and everything, he said, we're going to try a period of celibacy here, <laughs> you see? It, it, it's just bringing the mind through the guilt and loosening from the associations. So it's not like the old days of spirituality, the do's and the don'ts and all this and that, but it's letting the Holy Spirit be in charge. Wherever you have these pockets of guilt, these pockets that are pushed down out of awareness, they have to be brought up. And like Armel was saying, if, if, there, if it's wired in there with the ego of a great avoidance, then the Spirit may say, okay, I want you to do this, this, and this, and, and it actually can be a way of, of loosening the mind from the judgments that it's had, positively or negatively. Because in the end, remember, the Course teaches that, that the body is neutral to the Holy Spirit. To the ego, the body is far from neutral. It's a target for positive or negative, for attraction or repulsion. And yet, when you give the body and your mind and everything over to the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will pull you back into the miracle, which is that you yourself are the meaning, you yourself are the way, the truth, and the life. And it takes all the projections off the body. And that just seems to be like part of the fading away of desire. Really, it's just the desires becoming unified. The peace of God is my one goal, the aim of all my living here, the end I seek, my purpose, my function, and my life while I abide where I am not at home. It's taking us into a unified desire which unifies our mind and then everything that seemed to be kind of important from an ego sense just starts to become less important. So it's really beautiful how that works. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. It only hurts us, so let's stop it.